Well, good afternoon, everyone. It's good to be back. Sorry I missed everyone last week. I'm still fighting my cold. I got told Danny yesterday, it looked like I was relapsing. So you get a tape ready just in case. Then after the news last night, which everybody's heard and has been mentioned about the uh, terrorist attacks in, in Paris. So uh, I said, well, I really needed to be here. And God willing, I get enough strength to get this through with some zeal and some, some urgency. You know, we, we look at the, uh, the, the work of God's churches, and our goal is to warn. You know, and I'm going to talk about that today. It, it astonishes me how often people don't want to hear prophetic messages or current events. In the, in the churches of God, they're saying, you know, just we want to have, tell us how to have family living and how to get along with one another. And so, and we do have a, a lot of ministers do that. But the spearhead is, is I'm going to show you from Christ's, his, from his own example, 2,000 years ago was when he first began his ministry. It says, from that time he began to preach, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. You know, if anybody knew that the kingdom wasn't coming in his day, it was him. But he didn't know, I know he doesn't know the exact day or the hour. The sermon I've got today is the title, Are We in a Race Against Time? Are we in a race against time? You know, I looked at the wreckage now. We're going through the end of the year. And, and the COGMI has been in, in operation now for 10 years. And, you know, we have a proven track record every year. There's an increase. We're, God's blessed us with work every year, and we've grown each year. But my goodness, when we look at it, it's such a small increment compared to what needs to be done in a warning message. Like, how in the world are we ever going to get the warning out. And then we hear news like last night. I just got home from work yesterday and, uh, and I was doing something and Audrey came in and she said, did you hear the news? It could have been an hour since I, I did hear the news. And I said, no. So she, so she flipped the TV on. And so, of course, then you begin to hear how the terrorists of ISIS just blowing up people, machine gunning people, killing people. And you begin to realize that the mission of God's work is imperative because people don't understand. I heard a newsman today, this, this morning, is reporting as the, the, the report from the administration of the United States yesterday, President Obama, saying how ISIS is contained and, and how they're on the run. And it seems to me after watching the news, they're running after, not from. And so the news, the person this morning, he was uh, a dignitary from Europe. And he says, he says, your administration is living in Disney World. He says, it's a fantasy land. He said, the ISIS is the most, is the most deadly terrorist organization there has been in modern times. He said, there is no containing these people. They're in five countries and they're growing. And so... The context was taken out there contained in a little part of Iraq, I understand that. But the point is, is that it's lulling people into a sense of relaxation that the terrorism is growing. America is, is moving more and more out of the picture. And so I want to bring out today, are we in a race against time? Where, where do we stand right now? And there's certain scriptures that come in and I really try to relate to events that are prophetic in nature. And so there's a lot of things we just don't cover. Now, if you notice before September, everybody in the world was sending out these warning messages that the end of the world basically is here. You know, it's the Shemitah, it's the blood moons. And we never did that. We never talked about the financial collapse coming last September because there was no indication it was going to. It's because people don't understand prophetic events and what's taking place. And we've been really blessing God's church not to be able to take the sky as falling. But the events yesterday brings to, to reality that the world is changing rapidly. And you seen last week with the, with the Russian airplane that was brought down. So Russia steps into play, the United States backs out of the picture again. And so ISIS, in retaliation, brings down a Russian airliner killing 234 people or so. And here, yesterday, where we say ISIS has been contained, then they go out and show what they did last night. 
showing that they're not contained. And they're not going to be contained. And as long as America continues to remove that influence of control and domination around the world as a, is like the United States at the beginning of its, its day was like the light, a beacon on a hill, which is the type of an analogy to God's people into this world. We're going to continue to see things get worse and worse and worse. And we are going to see those events happen in America at some point. It is like some news person said, they can do the best job in the world to stop it, but they can't catch everything. And they will not catch everything. And you're bringing in 200,000 people into America of people who hate America for the most part. And so we're facing what we're coming up against is realization that we have a job to do. And it's through that job that, that I want to talk about today. But I'm not going to be a gloom and doom type of person because I want to, I want to talk about the reality of the importance of where God called us. It's, it's more than going to church on Saturdays. Look at, let's start with now in, in Numbers chapter 16. Like I said, I got this cold, so hopefully it'll still come across with, with, the, with the point I want to try to make of the concern and the alarm that we should have as God's people. Number 16, all right, let me give you the background on this. This is, this is a scripture where Korah was rising up the people against Moses. Now, in the worldwide, it used to be, they always use that example, if you challenged authority, you went the way of Korah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, everybody, y'all laughing, you've been there, huh? I, I, I've been there, too. I mean, I, I was like, <clears throat> I remember years ago, in, in my early, you know, when I was younger, I was, there was a minister who actually had a scripture, it was totally wrong, and it was putting women down, and I went and talked to him afterwards, and things never got better, got worse, and we got into a phone conversation, and I said, that's wrong, what you're saying. And next thing I know, I get this letter that I went the way of Cora. <laughs> and I was like, Audrey says, well, what was that? I said, I don't know, but I don't think it's good. <laughs> so I went and read about Cora. And I, for those who may not be familiar with the story, it became really familiar after I read that story because that's what I was accused of. And the way of Korah was the people who reviled them against Moses. Well, Moses was in direct command by God. And so basically they were going against God, not just Moses. So the, the, in the church it was like if you, if you question authority, you know, you're just like no better than anybody else. But that's not, what this, that's not what that's meant to be. It's the twisting of Scripture for control. So, so God tells, tells Moses to get all the people away. All right, so, so I'm going to pick up the story now where Korah had rebelled. And God's given Moses instruction, number 16, verse 20. All right. And the Lord said to Moses and to Aaron, Separate yourselves from among this congregation that I may consume them in a moment. And they fell on their faces and said, O God, the God of all the spirits of, one fle of the flesh, shall one man sin and will you be wroth with the entire congregation? So here's, here's what's been missed in all those stories is that is that even though this man sinned, Moses is stepping in here and he's saying, well, what about the rest of these people who haven't sinned? See, there's a message of compassion and there's a message of urgency here that's been missed that we don't pick up. So now we're looking at today, all right? We look at the events from last night. We, look, we know what's coming. The spirit in the churches in the past will be good. They're, they're going to get what they deserve. Wow. I was like that when I was young. Hey, I, we know the truth. We're warriors. We're going to go out there and we're going to set the world right. And these are just a bunch of sinners out there and they're going to get what they deserve. Well, that's not the, the entire message here. The message is God is going to give the world what it deserves. But there's a, there's a deeper message here in the sense of urgency that I'm trying to bring to you all today. Okay. All right. He says, will you be wroth with the entire congregation? So the Lord said to Moses, speak to the congregation, saying, get you up from the tabernacle of Korah, Dathan, and Abram. And Moses rose up and went to Dathan and Abram, and the elders of Israel followed him. And he spoke to the congregation, saying, depart, I pray you, from the tents of these wicked men, and touch nothing of theirs, lest you be consumed in their sins. All right. So at that point, the people are given an option here. Now, you can stay with the sinners, 
or you could follow God. That's our job. So when it comes down to the, to the warnings that's coming, because there's coming a time at the end that the wrath of God is going to come upon all flesh. So, so I, let me leave it there. I'm going to come back to that point in just a second. That the wrath of God is going to come upon all flesh. What should be our example? The example is right here. All right. So here we go. So they got so um, so they got up from the tabernacle of Korah and Dathan and Abiram on the one side, and Dathan came out, and they stood in the door of their tents, and their wives, and their sons, and their little children. And Moses said, Hereby you shall know that the Lord has sent me to do these works. For if for I have not done them of mine own. If these men die of common death of all men, or if they be visited after visitation of all men, then the Lord hath not sent me. But if the Lord make a new thing, and the earth, earth open her mouth and swallow them up with all appertained unto them, that they go down quickly into the pit, the pit, then they shall understand that these men have provoked the Lord. All right, so there you go. I mean, it wasn't against the authority of man on earth. Is that they was going against God. And the world at the end time is going to go against God. And so, and it came to pass that as, as he made an end of all the speaking of the words, that the ground clave asunder that was under them, the earth opened her mouth and swallowed them up, their houses and all that are pertained to Korah and all their goods. Now, remember, I said, I got that letter that I went the way of Korah. And I'm looking like. You know, you're waiting for the earth to open up. So I'm reading it, and Audrey goes, well, what's, what's it say? I said, this is not good. <laughs> this is not good. I'm, I'm making light of that now, but it was serious back then. You know, it was very serious. And when you're young and in the church, you just, I mean, your, your whole thing wraps around what everybody's teaching you out of Scripture. These people must know they've, they've been taught. They're learned men, you know, and who are you? So, and all that pertained and went down, so they went down alive into the pit, and the earth closed up on them, and they perished from among the congregation. And they perished from among the congregation. And then all Israel that were round about them fled, and they cried, for they said, that, lest the earth swallow us up also. And then there came a fire from the Lord who consumed 250 men that offered the incense. All right, so now, the question we started with, and the title of the sermon is, A Race Against Time. Right? So now we have the event. That was the main event. That's what took place. Korah was gone. The earth closed back up again. And they're completely gone as if they never were there. Now you would think that anybody in their right mind would realize that there's something was wrong here for doing what they did. Six verses later, pick it up in verse 41. But on the morrow of the congregation... The children of Israel murmured against Moses and Aaron, saying, You have killed the people of the Lord. <laughs> now, I don't know how you feel about that. I would have an absolute problem thinking to go do what they just did. Right? Now, let's bring that to reality today. All right, let's look at today now. Now, keep your spot here. Go to Revelation chapter 11. Revelation chapter 11. All right. And I'm going to read. I'm not going to read it all because we know the Scriptures. What I'm trying to do today is I'm trying to put perspective and reality that we can relate to today. All right. Revelation chapter 11. It's talking about the two witnesses. Look at verse 3. And I will give power to my two witnesses, and they will prophesy a thousand two hundred and threescore days clothed in sackcloth. Now, you know these, these, these scriptures. And you know they're going to preach, talking about bringing fire down. They're going to stop the rain. In, other, in, in, in short, they're going to wreak havoc on this earth for those who have sinned against God, trying to bring people to repentance. But now, just like those six verses later in verse 41... Let's pick up this, the story now in verse 10. All right. They killed the two people. They laying in the street in verse 10. And they that dwell on the earth shall rejoice over them and make merry, and they shall send gifts to one another because these two prophets tormented them that dwell on the earth. 
See the reasoning behind that? When I listen to the news today, and I listen to the reports of many of the reporters, they blame America and they blame Israel that the Islamic people are mad and slaughtering thousands and thousands of people. They blame us. It's our fault. And I'm looking at this, it's like, how in the world can anybody do this? Well, it's going to happen in huge proportions, and we got the example right here. It's misplaced anger of denial of guilt and denial of admitting what is wrong with the world in, in approval of sin. That is what's going on right now. This world is changing more rapid than you can keep up with. If I could lay out the plan of the Nazi regime from the 20s until the war actually began, 38 and 39 of World War II, I will show you an exact pattern taking place in America today. It is the change of the mentality of people to accept evil when rotten things happen. And they are being conditioned today to accept them. And who's at fault for all of this? The rotten people who keep up with these sacred covenants that God gave us and the people who want to keep the Constitution of the United States. Now, I want to tell you about that document. And I did that. And if you haven't seen it, you need to get the three-part series on the rise of the Holy Roman Empire because I talk about how important that document is. And when God put that document in place, He removed the threat of the evil that could stop the preaching of the warning at the end time. And the parallel is, is that when that document is removed, and they're saying it louder and louder and louder and in the universities, that they need to begin to remove that Constitution. And even senators are saying it's an outdated document that needs to be redefined. Well, let me tell you something. Without that document in place that God inspired, your safety as a Christian in this nation is removed. It's gone. You need to understand that. That's how powerful that document is that God put in place. And I can't be any stronger than that. In fact, when I was with the Mormon people, I told them, short of calling it sacred, because it's, I can't call it sacred, it's not. Only God's words are sacred. But it's divinely inspired. And so now we look at today. How long do we have before the mentality within our own nation is going to prevent us from saying what needs to be said? The same person who, who was talking about the concerns with the Muhammad, with the Islamic people, he said the, the, the parallel of not calling of this administration and our nation not being allowed to speak from the highest levels that this is Islamic terrorism is tantamount to telling the military on D-Day in World War II that you cannot go on the shores and call these people Nazis. When you can't even admit to what's going on, how will you stop what's going on? All right, do you see where I'm going? How much time do we have? All right, now let's go back into where we're at. Because there's an important story here now that I need to pick up. All right? It, was, it, was, it just blew my mind to say, it's your fault that these people were killed. Blame Moses and Aaron that all these things happened. Now you need to realize this. People are going to say, it's your fault. When things begin to go bad, bad things happen to their families, bad things happen to this nation, because you spoke up, it's your fault. You need to get that in your heads right now, because you need to be grounded in God's truth to know where you're coming from when these things begin to happen. Because they just saw God. Moses had no power to do that. But yet, they blamed Moses and Aaron. All right? It says, you have killed the people of the Lord. In verse 42, And it came to pass when the congregation gathered against Moses and Aaron that they looked toward the tabernacle of the congregation, and behold, the cloud covered it, and the glory of the Lord appeared. And Moses and Aaron came before the tabernacle of the congregation, and the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Get you up from among the congregation, that I may consume them as in a moment. Now, if God told you that, how, how would you react to that? 
We just say, well, finally, God's, they're going to get what they deserve. Now, but, but watch the reaction to Moses and to Aaron, all right? So God's telling them, get you up. And, and they fell on their faces. And Moses said to Aaron, take a censer. Now, God just told them, get away from them. So Moses tells Aaron, take a censer and put fire therein and off from the altar and put in the incense and go quickly attune to the congregation and make an atonement for them for there is wrath that has gone out from the Lord and the plague has begun. There was an intensity there. The name of the sermon was a race against time. Aaron was a race against time. He knew the longer he delayed, more people were going to die. How about us today? What do, we, what do we feel today? Now, there was, there was two points here. His first was the compassion for the people. They didn't turn around and retaliate. They accepted the scorn, and they went in to intervene on behalf of all those people. Now, that's an example for all of us. When God begins to, to move, there is going to come a time, and I'll show you that in Revelation, there is going to come a time that the wrath of God will go out. What will be your reaction? You know, like, finally, it's over. You know, go get them. Or will we be like, like we see here, the compassion that these two men had? So he took and they ran. He said, the plague has begun. And Aaron took, them, took, and Aaron took as Moses commanded, and he ran in the midst of the congregation. And behold, the plague was begun among the people, and he put incense and made atonement for the people. Now look at verse 48. This is one of the most powerful scriptures in the Bible. And he stood between the dead and the living. I'm going to tell you something. Your calling puts you between the dead and the living. You know that? Did you realize that? How important is your calling? How about the urgency in God's people today? You know, what I find amazing is that so many people, there's no urgency in God's churches. They, there's, and I'm not judging them, I'm praying for them. I, I want to find, how do we... How do we how do we rekindle that urgency and the time and the warning? You know, and I look at prophecy and I'm looking and so, say, you know, it could easily go 2028, 20, 2040, 20, 2050 in prophecy. I know that. I understand that. But what if it doesn't? What if God decides to cut things short? Because there's two scriptures that we can't ever, if you figured it out, if you were wise enough to say, you know, I got it all figured out. Now, somebody gave me when I traveled this past feast a book about that thick and you got it all figured out. Christ was coming back in 2004. That's 11 years ago. 11 years, and they just gave it to me. Because he said, oh, but I forgot to figure this one out. No, I'm sorry, nobody's going to figure it out. And even if you could, let me say this, even if you could, there's two scriptures, and I'm going to show you one in Revelation. God says when it's time, the trumpet's about to sound, that angel's going to blow, it's to end it. God said, no, go warn him again, Right? And then the one in Revelation, I mean, Matthew, I'm going to tell you in just a second, God says, cut time short. How do you figure that one out? So there's no way to really know. But here's, what, here's the point I'm trying to make. You stand between the dead and the living. Why? Because this world is dead. It's over for the world, except for those that God has called right now. So it's our job to go stand between the dead and the living. How important is that to you? How about to your family? You know, a lot of people don't even want to talk about it with their own families because they say, oh, you know, there's a bunch of cult people out there. And you've been saying that since Mr. Herbert back in the 30s, and God's got plenty of time. Well, quite possibly they're right. But there's no way to know. But you know what you're judged on? Judge, God's judging you from the inside. And he will judge you on your urgency to warn, to get to the messengers out. Let's go now. I want to go to Matthew 20. Um, well, Matthew 25, I think we know. Let me just go there. I don't, I don't want to use some of these scriptures as old shop worn analogies that we all know and, and bringing them out. I'm trying to bring out points here today that maybe we haven't touched on to show the importance of the urgency and the compassion and love to be able to warn people and not in a judgmental nature. So we know in Matthew 25, in verse 1, it talks about the condition of the church. Matthew 25. 
it says in verse 1, And then the kingdom of heaven shall be likened to the virgins with their lamps, and they went to meet the bridegroom. Five were wise, and five were foolish. And they that were foolish took their lamps, they took no oil with them. And basically it was shown at the church, church at the end time. They're all still there. They're all still basically working, they're still doing things, and they're all asleep, by the way. Not, all, not just half of them, they're all asleep. But even though they took a nap, they were sleeping, it was nighttime, five of them were ready for the return of Christ. The other was going through the motions, and they weren't ready. So we know the story, so my, my point isn't there. But the point is this, is that God shows that there's an urgency that we need to incorporate in our own lives. All right? So it, it has to be to where God is bringing us in our lives to have that urgency. So when I see things like that took place last night, and you hear all the insane leaderships of this nation who, who, who don't even want to admit to what's going on. And I can't help but to remember a few years ago when we were in the TSA offices here in New Orleans and cleaning their carpets and I got a chance to talk to the people. There's no way to describe that agent when I was talking to him about the concerns of what was coming. Because back then it was talking about the rise in Egypt in the Muslim Brotherhood. And we're talking about the Islamic rise and what's coming to America. And the look on his face when he says, this nation has no idea what's coming. And there was no way to describe the urgency in that man's face. I believe this nation knows what's coming. I believe they're paralyzed to stop it. They can only prevent things and delay things. But there's no way to completely stop what's coming. And I think he knows that. And I believe that's part of the reason why they have so many activities around this country preparing for civil unrest. And we're beginning to see some of the cities in civil unrest. And you're going to have, when you have 200,000 people coming to America who hate us, they will rise up and they will begin creating havoc on a scale that is unimaginable within our own nation. Look at Matthew 24. Matthew 24. All right. A scripture we all know in verse 21. Remember now, we, we read from uh, the Old Testament that you stood, that, that Aaron stood between the living and the dead. Now let's put that into today's terms. Matthew 24, verse 21, it says, Then there shall be great tribulation. That was not since the beginning of the world to this time. No, nor ever shall be. And except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. So there we have it. See, God's own word tells you, you stand between the living and the dead. If it wasn't for your calling that God has given to you, no flesh would be saved. That's a pretty powerful statement. So now, what about the urgency if you know that, are you running through the camp of Israel with your censer, with the incense, to warn, to stop the plague that's coming? The people there with, with Moses, with Aaron, they had no idea of what Aaron was doing for them. Most of our families have no idea what you're doing for them either. They don't understand, they can't comprehend what God has called you to be a part of. And it's not important at this time that they do understand. What is important is that God knows what you're doing. And you need to stand up and be counted in as much love and compassion as you can possibly muster. That means with all congeniality, with all love, with all compassion, that you go there to help, not to condemn. That you go there to plead and to warn and not to, not to condemn. To admonish and to help, not to condemn. But in the past so often it was, we, it was like we wanted to condemn everybody else because they're rotten, evil sinners and they're going to get what they deserve. But that's not the example that I'm seeing here with the urgency. And the urgency here is that God's watching us to see how many people can you, can you help? How many people can you put in that sensor between dead and living? They're not going to look at you right now. It doesn't matter because God says it doesn't matter where they will. Go back to Isaiah and Ezekiel. He says you go tell them anyway. At some point, some of them will. Some of them will. 
And I'm gonna tell you about Project Go and how, how it's starting to take off already uh, in, in, in this warning message that a handful of people. Now, Aaron was one person. Individually, each one of us can be one person with that warning going out in your own area, running through your camp. All right. Now, let's go to Matthew chapter 4. All right, Matthew chapter 4. I find the example of Christ is, is the important thing is that, you know, at the beginning of his ministry, you know, he began with Matthew 4. All right, so in Matthew chapter 4, I began in uh, verse 12. It says, Now when Jesus had heard that John was cast into prison, he departed into Galilee, and leaving Nazareth he came, and he dwelt in Capernaum, which was upon the sea coast, in the borders of Zebulon and Naphtali, that might be fulfilled which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying that the land of Zebulon, the land of Naphtali, by the way of the sea, beyond Jordan, in Galilee, and the Gentiles, the people which sat in darkness saw great light. Every person you go to, that you bring that lamp, that censer, uh, that incense to, to, to stand between light and death, they sit in darkness. If they don't have the truth of God, they don't know. And until they have the truth of God and repent, they don't know. So people in the world, there's, believe me, there's a sense of urgency in, the church, in many of the churches right now. They don't understand the truth yet. But, so when you hear their warnings go out, they fall on deaf ears because they're not based upon anything. They based upon Christ is coming back, and they said, "Who did Christ here?" So it just does nothing but but drive people away from the truth, because they don't understand the truth and they can't put it all together. But they can look at the world and they can see something's going on, and inside themselves they're running and trying to warn. I see that when I travel now, and I'm watching these people, and I say, "I'm watching them. It's like oh, these people got urgency in them. They don't have the truth." So how do we put the truth in these people with the urgency? And then here with the people in the churches of God, I get letters from people going, oh, here it goes again, another prophetic sermon. I say, my goodness, what's the matter with God's people? You know, there's plenty of sermons on family living. We've got all the other ministries, they do that. You know, I did last, the last two sermons I did on Under the Hood on family living. But believe me, these things need to be foremost. Why? Because the example right here with Christ, or what's the example? All right, so now, the people who sat in darkness, they saw, they saw great light, and then which sat in the region of death, saw light spring up. And from that time, this is the very beginning of Jesus' ministry, he began to preach and say, repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. The very first recorded message of Jesus Christ's warning is to repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. Now, he knew he had at least 2,000 years. It didn't stop him. That was the example. And now we can go to Matthew 28. Let's go there. Matthew 28, in case people are not familiar with that. The scripture probably, people get so tired of <laughs> these same scriptures, like, oh, here we go, I don't want to go through that. I mean, I was in the church, and I used to hear these scriptures over and over again. It's like, oh, here we go again. All right, but I'm trying to bring them in a sense of urgency today. Matthew 28, verse 18. And Jesus came and he spoke to them, saying, All power is given unto me, earth and in, in earth and heaven. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end. So from the beginning of his ministry to his final teachings and the gospel accounts with his apostles, he starts with and he ends with, Go, warn the world. And that's what we do. And that's why we can't stop. And now when we see the things rising of the urgency and around the world, we see that now more than ever we need to be there doing that. It was interesting here the word, go ye therefore. When we began doing project, this, we're calling it project go, by the way. I didn't know how to, what to talk about when, when we, we was beginning the outreach. As you can notice, I know you can't see it on the camera, but our, our studios are gone, completely gone. We talked about now what we're going to do is we're trying to get everything back and running by January. We've got two months. We're going to use this wall, and we're going to begin building sets with interactive TV screens now that we've never had that we can get now that we're going to be working with, and a large big screen on the back, and it's going to be interactive. We're going to build three studios over here instead of two. We get away from the green screen. And it's going to be multifunctional. 
to where we're going to be able to talk to people with that big screen and be able to use the, the video Skyping back and forth over the next year or two and be ready to go so when events that happen like yesterday, we can get a phone call, tell Danny, get in here, we need to get this ready and get Jeff down here and anybody else who wants to be a part of this and come in and so say, we got to cover this right now and be able to be out there live when events begin to happen to talk about how these events affect people's lives. We began to do that in our TV specials last year. The very first one, I don't know if you noticed how God moved us through in those TV specials. The very first one, you almost never see me in that video. Go back and watch it. What I did is I deliberately, when I video edited myself, sat back and I edited almost everything I had to say because I wanted them to tell their stories. So for almost one hour, you see me on, on the edge of it, and I'll make a comment here and there, but almost the entire was being able to get those men who was in that TV interview to give their message. And I told Steve Council when I was up there, I said, Steve, the time is not right. They're not going to listen to us now because they don't believe what we have to say. I said, our time will come, and it came in the second time. So in the second DVD, when the whole, all of those people and all the warnings came out, and the Internet was filled with people warning that the end's coming. I talked to Pastor Dan. I was on his radio program just two, two weeks ago. And I said, things got eerily quiet after the September, and he busted out laughing. I said, you're not getting anybody talking about the prophecies in September anymore? He laughed. He says, man, before September, everybody's calling me trying to get on a radio show. He said, but when September came and went, and they were all wrong, nobody's calling me. He said, I heard from anybody. <laughs> I thought that was pretty funny. I said, now they got the time they're going to listen to us. Why? Because we bid our time. We waited till God brought us to the forefront. And we began to talk about events that were important. So we did the second TV special, and it drew interest from around the country. And so we knew that God had moved us into the right path. And people began to say, send me more DVDs. And we had one lady come in and buying DVDs from, the, from our, the, the personal account that we had from the business end. And she's giving them to pastors in her city. I said, wow. I said, this lady's on fire. And the other person says, my pastor's got to hear this. She said, send me another copy. And so she can give it to her. And then their family members started calling, and they're all getting DVDs. I said, these people are on fire. Something inside that DVD. What was in that DVD? In that DVD, we, the, it, um, it was handwriting on the wall, in case you're wondering which one I'm talking about for the DVD. All right. We, you know what we talked about? We talked about the covenant of God. We talked about America being Israel. We talked about the rise of the beast. We talked about the man of sin. We pulled all these together, and then we talked about the Sabbath, and God's plan, and His holy days, all within one hour. And the people heard it were on fire. Now, they don't understand everything they heard, but it was enough seeds of saying something's in this DVD. So we said, now we need to take that and see if we can bring it into the churches. So after the feast, I got in touch with Dixon Cartwright with the journal. A lot of you know who the journal is, that it's the churches of the news. And he was absolutely amazed. And I told him about the story with going up and visiting with the Mormons up there and talking to them and how they're studying the Sabbath. And I heard, by the way, that some of them are talking about keeping the Feast of Tabernacles next year. Now, I don't know how that's going to split them all up there, but they're talking about doing that and asked me to come back in the spring holy days and talk to them again. So I don't know if we're going to be able to get that worked out or not. But these people are on fire. So as we're going through this and I'm putting it all together, I'm saying, what do we call this? I mean, we've got to have a, a, a name for doing this. How do we, what do we call it? Audrey says, just call it Go. Grassroots Outreach. I said, yeah, that's pretty cool. Grassroots Outreach, Go. And you get the scripture here. Jesus Christ said, Go. So that's what we're doing. Then two weeks ago, we get a call from a gentleman in Dallas. And in Dallas, he was so inspired by the message that he told his community of religious people he worships with. I don't know what church he's got, what that he's with. So he asked, told everybody about his special, and he, was, he talked it up. And he said he's going to show it for his Bible study group. He said they had standing room only. 102 people came. And those people were so amazed with what they saw. It's the truth of God that's being introduced to them. And it's putting it to current events, and they know something's got to happen that they, one of the ladies created a flyer, they're going to send me a copy of it. And they said they're sending it to their neighborhoods, and they're giving it to their friends, and they're going to run the special again. And they said they think they're going to get 300 people next time. 
So we're talking to him about going up there and doing a public lecture to these people. So Project Go began. Then I get a letter from another rabbi over in Texas yesterday, and a letter from a guy up in Canada that said, add me to this outreach. And we put it on Pastor Dan, and he promoted it on his radio show, and he put it on his website. So people are writing in. And we're going to be talking about it to go out and to do the work. So we're working hard because we want to run. We want to run through the camp of Israel. And the TVs, you can't put this stuff on TVs. I've, I've not yet talked to the LaCie broadcast and since the conference and hadn't even written me back in any emails I sent to them. It's like, okay, we're done with this one. Let's not go down that way to again. <laughs> the story we has to, be, has to be told will not be carried on television. Now, I know the larger churches have a large TV ministry, you know, of the churches of God, and they spend millions of dollars, but they have to be so guarded as to what they say, they can't really say what needs to be said. But I believe what God's doing for us today, what I'm telling you all, is that I think we're in the camp of Israel when we have to run and the people who are going to run is going to be the grassroots. Those people say, yeah, count me in. I want to be a part of this. And we're going to be adding, we we'll put an ad in the journal. And we're going to take a half page ad that's going to run for three months. It was going to be accompanied with a 1500 word article that I already sent to Dixon Cartwright. And we're going to have as many of the churches of God who want to be a part. And we're hoping that we can, we can create this zeal to stand between the living and the dead. And God will weigh us in account of what we're doing as we go through. So Christ gave us that example of what, we, of, of what we need to be working on and that we need to function with. Now, let's go to Revelation chapter 10. Let's go to Revelation chapter 10. In verse 1 it says, And I saw a mighty angel came down from heaven clothed with a cloud, and a rainbow was on his head. And his face was though it were the sun, and his teeth were like pillars of fire. And he had in his hand a scroll, and he said, his, he's, and he set his his right foot in the sea, and his left foot on the earth. And he cried with a loud voice, where a lion roars. And when he had cried, seven thunders uttered their voices. And when the seven thunders had uttered their voices, I was about to write, and I heard a voice from heaven say to me, Seal up those things which the seven thunders had uttered, and write them not. And the angel whom I saw standing on the sea and upon the earth lifted up his hand to heaven and swore by him that lives forever and ever. And he created heaven and earth and things and all that is in it. So he's talking to Christ because all things that were created by Christ at the time. So he, he looks up and said, And the earth and all things that were in it and the sea and all things that were in it, that there should be delayed no longer. But in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he shall begin to sound, the mystery of God should be finished as he had declared to his servants, the prophets. So here's the picture now. You got this, this angel, he's about to sound the seventh trump, and he's got his feet, one on earth and one on, one on land, I mean, sea and on the earth, and he's about to blow it, and, and God says, Whoa, stop. Seal it up. Let's, let's, let's go down in verse, in verse 11. He said to me, You must prophesy again about many peoples and many nations and tongues and kings. So when you, just when you think it's over, God says, go again. Why is God doing that? Well, I, I, don't, I don't pretend to know all the mind of God, believe me. But I know the example we just read back in the Old Testament. That as Aaron took that, that's in, the, the, the censer and filled with the incense and he ran through the camp, maybe God's given you and I the time to save more lives. Why else would he hold up the inevitable? It says, go again. I love that. That's the project go. And so I'm, I'm, I threw that in there. He didn't say go again. It says, you must prophesy again. In other words, go again. And so we must go again. We must warn the nations. And the truth is, if you walked out now in this society, I doubt seriously that you'll find one person out there could give you the plan of God. And so in Matthew it says, I send you, let me read in Matthew 10, Behold, I send you as sheep in the midst of wolves. Be you therefore wise as serpent, harmless as doves. But beware of men, for they shall deliver you up to the councils, and they shall so scourge you in their synagogues. You can't be doing that if, if you're not out there preaching and warning. 
And as we began this sermon, they're going to blame you for their problems. I was up in one of the states in the Northeast, and I was doing this warning, and the lady actually came up to me in the congregation. She says, why are you doing this? You're just going to bring persecution on us. Honest to goodness. I said, and I, didn't, I honestly didn't know how to react to that at the first. So, how do you not warn the nations? In other words, you can't hide. You got to be out there because God will protect you, and we need to be warning. It says, uh, for they shall deliver you up. Take no thought on how you shall speak. It shall be given you in the same hour of what you shall speak. For it is not you that speaks, but the spirit of your father, which is in you, speaks. I believe that's what's in those messages that people are being on fire about. I tried to wonder, what was the difference between any other minister getting up and giving the same message that Mr. Herbert or Garnet Ted used to give? Why would they react to one message and not another? Why would they, why would they, the spirit, why are they reacting to that DVD? It's the message that's in there because that message is going with the spirit of God. And what they're hearing is the power of God. They're not hearing Tom Carey or anyone else. They're hearing the message and that message has caught their attention. And so when you're speaking with God and you let God speak with you, and when you're talking to your family and your friends, you have to have the power of God carry your voice. And they will hear the voice, not you. And they don't know that. And that's what makes the difference. And so it goes through here. Let me go on. And brother shall deliver you up to death, and father is child. Verse 22, and they shall, you shall be hated of all men for my name's sake, but he that endures to the end. So the job here is, is that we need to be warned. And God says, you will have not gone through the house of Israel, of all the cities of Israel, before the end comes. Which, by the way, is an interesting point for those who believe in just one house. And it's not my point to fight the one house, two houses of Israel. But, but if, if, if the one house of Israel is that one little nation over there, surely we can hit every city. Surely we can hit every city in that little nation. But the word of God says, you will have not gone to all the cities of Israel before the end comes. Therefore, there must be more than what they're saying. I don't know why people don't look at scriptures for what they say. Now, let's go back in one more, in, in closing now. I want to go back to Numbers 25 because there's another sense of urgency. Numbers 25. The first, one we, the first one we focused on in number 16, it focused on the concern for the children of Israel. Not upon bringing wrath upon them, but stepping in to save people's lives. And that's the focus that I wanted to bring out. There's more messages than that. I know that. Because it's, well, God's word is multiplicity. Is you can go to one scripture and I can study it today and talk about one event and, talk, and bring it to this area. I can take the same scripture next week and talk about it and bring it to another area. All right, so now on this one here, I'm going go to I'm gonna go to Numbers 25. Right, Numbers 25. Talking about Israel at the end times, because this is important, is that Israel was sinning, and they had begun breaking God's law, very much like America today. Look what it says here, verse, verse 1. And Israel abode in, in Shittim, and the people began to commit harlotry with the daughters of Moab, and they called, they being the women, and they called the people unto the unto the sacrifices of their gods. Now their god was Chemosh. I believe it was primarily the Chemosh. That god was the god of, of, like, of control and of rapture. For, of, uh, it was also like a fish god too. It was like a god of the fish. But it was like he was in control. And it was of, of basically you know, destroying their own children too. So, and so they, they, the they brought the people of Israel to their sacrifices of their gods, and the people did eat, and they bowed to their gods. Now, what's going on in America today? The nation of America was, was founded upon the, the foundation of God. You know, Jesus Christ, it was basically a, a Christian nation why we were formed. Well, today you can't have that. It's not fashionable. It's not legal anymore to, to, to worship God. And we can't say anything against the other gods or Islam because it offends people. And so what we do is we go out of our way 
to allow them to worship in public, in the public places and where Christianity cannot be brought no more. And so we're moving into an area where the people need to be told that what you're doing is wrong. But it has to be done out of the concern and the warning message. And that's the hard part, to find that balance. And God will give you that ability to be able to do that. So Israel joined himself to Baal Peor, and the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel. And that is what we have done this year. And we showed that in Tammuz 17. By the way, that DVD now is on the table in the back. If you haven't got it, get it and bring it with you. Tammuz 17. It's, it's talking about tying into the, the Muslim uh, uh, faith and the history and rising, taking our nation down and bringing up uh, basically the, the beast of Revelation. And puts it on a time frame and showing how that all happened last year. While the whole world was waiting for the return of Christ, we showed in that DVD that this was the beginning of the rise of the beast. And I want to be able to bring down in the future to be very careful. So if to ask a question, what if you could pinpoint a day that the beast of Revelation awoke? Wouldn't that be interesting? Well, I know we can never do that, but I'll tell you how close we can get. I tell you, we can get close enough to saying on the Day of Atonement, 2015, that beast began to rise. Whether it woke that day, I, I don't know. And that beast will sit on that throne, just like it did before. And it will be for three and a half years, just like the Bible predicts. And it will be that holy Roman revival. And this world needs to know it, whether they want to hear it or not. It needs to be told. All right, so going on. In verse 4, And the Lord said to Moses, Take heed, take the heads of all the people and hang them before the Lord against the sun. That's pretty, that almost sounds like the Muslim people. Would take the heads of them and hang them up before that the, that the Lord may, I mean, back it up, and hang them before the Lord and against the sun that the fierce anger of the Lord may be turned away. And Moses said to the judges of Israel, Slay every one of his men that were joined to be out, Peor. There's coming a time that God himself will bring, bring forth the wrath to do these events for those who will not separate themselves from evil. And it's our job to bring that warning to as many people as possible so, as, so this does not have to happen to, and it's going to happen, but some people will repent before it takes place. And so the plague that began, and so now let me go on. He says, And behold, one of the children of Israel came and brought to his, his brethren a Midianite woman in the sight of Moses and in the sight of all the congregation of the children of Israel who were weeping before the door of the tabernacle. And then Phinehas, the son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron the priest, saw it, and he rose up among the congregation and he took a javelin in his hand. So let me tell you what the event. Here comes the Midianite woman, like a prostitute, coming into the, house of, into the camp of Israel from another god. Now, what did we just read about? The people, they're slaughtering people and they're hanging heads up and they're bringing the, these, all these people that were sinning against God and hear the total disregard to right and wrong in the middle of all of this continue to sin. And Israel is being brought with plagues on them. In this nation, while all these events that are taking place and the evil that's rising up is like the people don't care. And the sin gets worse and worse and worse. It has become a nation of lawlessness. And in the middle of all of this, it's like this, there's a guy that just brings in a woman into the camp of Israel and the sin before everybody's eyes. We need to stand up. And we need to stand up and warn with all the power and the energy that God can give us. And we're going to work toward that in this coming year. And, and, I, and I'm thinking, and it's, maybe it's just my hope, and I'm, sometimes I tease and I said, you know, I got this feeling sometimes it's just indigestion. You burp and it's over. But I, I got a feeling that what I'm seeing of the people who've been calling in, and I've asked Audrey to write an article for the quarterly that we'll have finished next week, to tell everybody what she's hearing when people call in. Because the people are calling in, they know something's wrong. And when they've been getting this DVD, they said, we've never seen this before. We've never heard this. And you know what it's given them? 
It's given them hope. It's helping stand between life and death. And we've had people who were in Worldwide many, 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 many years ago who found the program and wrote in and said, you know, I remember I used to be in Worldwide. They're talking about 20 years ago, 30 years ago. And, and one lady actually called in and told Artie, oh, you need to start keeping the Sabbath too and keeping the holy days. The lady out of California. And she says, we do. And then finally the lady says, well, you must have been in Worldwide too. She goes, yeah, I was. And they had a big laugh and it was like old home week again. What it's doing is stirring up the people. Just imagine now. All right, try to imagine this. Project Go is like a sensor. And anybody in any city, city could be a part to begin to run through the camp. And in their own areas, they begin to send out that warning that is multiplied by 100, by 1,000. And we're hoping by January to have, when we finally launch everything, to cover many cities across this nation from a ground roots in a way that has never been done before. Because you see, we didn't know two years ago or three years ago, and you have always said, and you've heard me on this tape, I said, how do we reach the masses without money? I think God has showed us. It's the people. And God is now giving us the tools to be able to use now to put it into the hands of God's people and turn them loose and let them go with God and let God lead them to warn this nation. I don't know how much time we have, but I do know this. We are in a race against time. And we'll all get there together at the time of the return of Jesus Christ. Pray for Project Go. Pray that God will bless us to be able to reach many, many more people. Um, and we'll try to keep reporting on all the things that are happening because it's been very good. It's been, you know, the news has been exciting. The phone calls have been exciting. The emails. I got a letter from an email, an email from a person in Canada. And he wrote, and he says, it must be really exciting to be a part of all of that. I hope you feel that way. It is exciting to be a part of God's plan for the redemption of mankind.